Senior Fellow in Political Economy at the Independent Institute. Robert Higgs, before we get to your books, I want to ask you to respond quickly to some recent headlines in the paper and get your views on those. This is from the Financial Times. G20 leaders hail crisis fight back, 1.1 trillion global boost agreed. And along that same line is this headline, nations craft hard fought pledge to repair world financial system. This is what we would expect them to do, is to pretend to know what they ought to be doing to uh, repair the economic troubles we face right now and to come up with a program of some sort that uh, is a plausible solution. Uh, I don't think it will be a plausible solution, or at least it won't be uh, an actual solution, but uh, it's what leaders do in the world. Why don't you think it will be a plausible solution? Well, the idea that uh, the situation we're in can be repaired merely by spending a lot of money uh, through governments, uh, money that, that these governments in most cases don't even possess and will have to go into debt in order to spend, is really intellectually bankrupt. Uh, it's a holdover from uh, what I call vulgar Keynesianism, a body of thought that's very popular uh, among politicians and the public, but it has uh, practically no scientific standing at all. In the Politico, recent headline, Obama scores early win with budget vote, $3.6 trillion budget passed, $1 trillion plus deficit. <laughs> Politicians love to spend money. Uh, every dollar of that uh, makes someone beholden to the people who made it happen. So uh, they're taking advantage of the situation. They're exploiting it to, uh, to uh, represent themselves as the saviors of the world and to direct money uh, particularly to, to those people they favor for one reason or another, uh, often uh, people who help them get elected. What do you think when you hear $3.6 trillion annual federal budget, $1 trillion deficit? I'm what appalled. These magnitudes would have been unthinkable not long ago. Uh, but uh, we hear almost every week some enormous new uh, government proposal for spending, lending, trading assets, guaranteeing, propping up, bailing out. Uh, this is the uh, government policy of the day. And uh, unfortunately, I'm sure we're going to have more and more of it uh, in the next uh, few months and perhaps longer than that. From the New York Times, U.S. plan seeking expanded power in seizing firms. Proposal is aimed at companies deemed too big to fail. Well, uh, they say they're too big to fail, but uh, if they didn't bail them out, they, they would fail and then we'd uh, discover that uh, the world kept spinning. Uh, it's a good story. It uh, stokes people's fears, and nothing works better for a politician than making people afraid. Has the government stepped in too much, in your view, in the recent months during this economic crisis? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, almost everything it's done it has been, in my view, a mistake. And uh, the kind of action that will actually make our situation worse and take us longer to get out of it. And finally, the Wall Street Journal. Government forces out Wagner at GM. <laughs> it's a very bad precedent because uh, Mr. Wagner really didn't work for the, the government of the United States, and yet we have the government presuming to uh, decide who's going to be the manager of a, a private corporation. Uh, of course, the private corporation is receiving great sums of money from the government in loans to keep it afloat, but nonetheless, uh, this, uh, I'm sure, will come back to haunt us because it moves us further and further in the direction of government control of the economic process. Welcome to In-Depth. This is Book TV's monthly series featuring one author and his or her body of work. We want to hear from you. Our guest this month is Robert Higgs, who is associated with the Independent Institute. and We'll ask him about that in just a minute. And here are some of his books so you get an idea of what a political economist writes about and his views. Neither Liberty Nor Safety, Fear, Ideology, and the Growth of Government was written in 2007. In 2006, this book came out, Depression, War, and Cold War, Studies in Political Economy, published by Oxford. In 2000, uh, 2005, I believe, Resurgence of the Warfare State, 
The Crisis Since 9-11. These are three of his books. Then there is Against Leviathan, Government Power in a Free Society, and Crisis in Leviathan, Critical Episodes in the Growth of American Government. And you can see here this pile of books. These are books that he's edited or contributed to also that we will uh, uh, get through in the next three hours. We want to put the phone numbers up in case you want to participate in our conversation. 202 is the area code. 737-0001 for those of you who reside in the east and central time zones. 737-0002 for the Mountain and Pacific. And if you have a question throughout this three hours that you would like to email in to Dr. Higgs, booktv at cspan.org is the email address. And, and we'll begin taking your calls in about 10 minutes or so. Dr. Higgs, fear is a recurrent theme in all of your books. And in fact, it's in the subtitle of your most recent book. Why? Because uh, fear is the, the, the elemental and powerful human emotion. Uh, it's the thing that uh, human beings are least able to ignore. Uh, fear also puts people in a frame of mind where it's very difficult for them to behave rationally. Uh, they're more, more likely to behave instinctively uh, and uh, they're more likely to look for salvation uh, wherever they can find it. And uh, for that reason, uh, governments have always relied on fear uh, to keep subjects in line, uh, and they're continuing to rely on it today. Could you give an example? Absolutely. The, everything we know about how governments in their current form uh, came into being uh, tells us they arose from conquest uh, from one group uh, over another group. And uh, that meant that uh, fear was involved in the very beginning because it was usually violence, uh, warfare, uh, that brought about this conquest. And, and after the conquest was completed, uh, the threat of violence continued to uh, be applied to subject peoples in order to uh, make them uh, cough up tribute uh, to their conquerors. And so uh, fear for people's very lives is at the root uh, of governments as they exist in the world today. And, uh, and even though many people uh, may not feel uh, a surface fear or an, uh, an awareness of fear of the government, it's very easy to make them afraid of government if you start to remind them of ways in which the government might hurt them if they get out of line. From Crisis in Leviathan, published in 1987, this is what you write. We know that other great crises will come, whether they will be occasioned by foreign wars, economic collapse, or rampant terrorism, no one can predict with assurance. Yet in one form or another, great crises will surely come again. When they do, governments almost certainly will gain new powers over economics and social affairs. We've seen it happen in the past uh, eight or nine years, all three of them at once. Example. Well, uh, the beginning, of course, is 9-11, uh, which is uh, a combination of uh, rampant terrorism and, uh, uh, and war. It's represented as war. I, I think in many ways it's misleading to view it as such. But nonetheless, uh, it, it evoked a government response known as the war on terror or the war on terrorism. And, uh, and we, we've been at it ever since in, in some way. And uh, the military activities of the United States in Afghanistan and in uh, Iraq are direct uh, uh, consequences uh, of that attack. Now, uh, we've, we've also had uh, a certainly economic debacle uh, that became especially apparent starting in the summer of uh, 2008 and grows steadily worse as the recession deepens. So we certainly have the uh, economic problems that uh, have caused a lot of uh, fear and concern and, and political response. So uh, we, we've got uh, war, terrorism, economic troubles all at once right now. In Neither Liberty Nor Safety, published 2007, you have a chapter called 18 Problematic Propositions in the Analysis of the Growth of Government. What are these propositions? 